This is StoryBeat, Storytellers on Storytelling, an exploration into how master storytellers and artists develop and build brilliant stories and works of art that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators of all kinds find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuton. Thanks for joining us on StoryBeat. We're coming to you from the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University in the heart of downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today is the award-winning screenwriter and story editor, Len Yuli. Len was the 2014 recipient of the highly prestigious Writers Guild of America Animation Writers Caucus Animation Writing Award, which he received in recognition of his 30-year career and his outstanding contributions to animation writing. Len made his first professional sale while still a junior at UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television. Later, an introduction to a story editor at Walt Disney TV Animation led to a staff position at Disney in 1986, where he wrote episodes of DuckTales, Adventures of the Gummy Bears, Tailspin, Winnie the Pooh, Chippendales Rescue Rangers, Darkwing Duck, Bonkers, and Marsupilami. Len's freelance work includes multiple assignments for three different Ben 10 series, Alien Force, Ultimate Alien, and Omniverse. He's also written for Static Shock, Super Book, and the UK-based series RoboZuna, Friends and Heroes, and The 99. He's written for numerous action shows, for instance, Thunderbirds Are Go, Transformers, Robots in Disguise, Nico and the Sword of Light, Batman, Justice League, The Avengers, Iron Man, He-Man, Kaijudo, The Fantastic Four, Robocop, Skeleton Warriors, Zorro, Young Hercules, and three versions of X-Men. Comedy properties Len has written for are Dorothy and the Wonders of Oz, Scooby-Doo, Thousand and One Nights, Ozzy and Drix, and a pilot for Archie. And he's even written for series designed for very young viewers like Rescue Bots, Rusty Rivets, Octonauts, Crypto the Superdog, and Strawberry Shortcake. He worked with DreamWorks Classics and Big Idea Entertainment on two VeggieTales home video releases, and he was a staff writer on the second season of Disney Junior's Miles from Tomorrowland. In 2012, Len was nominated for a Writers Guild of America Award for his Ben 10 Ultimate Alien episode, Moonstruck. He's previously shared five Emmy nominations for his work at Warner Brothers and at Disney TV Animation. In addition, he won the Entertainment Industries Council's PRISM Award for an episode of Ozzy and Drix called Where There's Smoke. Len has been a story editor on series produced by Warner Brothers, Disney, and MGM, and has written more than 200 television episodes and home videos for pretty much every studio in the animation universe. On top of his TV work, Len has also written three animated features for Universal Studios Home Entertainment, The Land Before Time 7, An American Tale 3, and An American Tale 4. Well, it is a great, great pleasure for me to welcome to Storybeat my good friend Len Yuli. Len, welcome. Thank you, Steve. It's, it's uh, lovely to be back in touch, and thank you for um, uh, saying all those things about me. Well, they're true. They're, 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 hopefully they're all true. I assume that they are because I wasn't there for every one of them, but I was there for a few of them. Like we worked together on Skeleton Warriors back in the early 90s. We worked at Disney yeah, together. Yeah, that was, that was uh, one of those uh, everybody get together and write something as quickly as possible assignments. And we, we had fun doing it though. You know, that's the weird thing. Sometimes these things that are sort of, um, uh, you know, under a deadline can be great fun. Well, we, we were fortunate that way. There's no question that uh, I, I think there's more fun in doing something fast that has some kind of success than doing something that drags out forever. Yes, yes. And, but we can talk about development some other time. Absolutely. We may get into it a little <laughs> bit today, hopefully. Uh, yeah. You know, you've, you've written across a fairly wide spectrum of animation genres, obviously, from all these different titles and for different age category, uh, categories with uh, you know varying styles and tones. What would you say... Uh, from a writer's perspective, what are the major differences, if any, in approaching storytelling, say, for teens versus for preschool? What do you have to think about differently as a writer? Well, um, my sweet spot, uh, you know, the, the 
biggest part of, of my uh, catalog there that you mentioned is in the boys' action adventure, and that can be hard action stuff or comedy action adventure. Uh, writing preschool is, I think, more of a challenge in a lot of ways because you often have an educational consultant. You have to have a, you know, some shows have a very light touch on the curriculum. Some are very, very heavy-handed in terms of what they are trying to uh, impart. And uh, those are very different challenges. There are some people we both know who do that brilliantly. Yes. Uh, it is, I think, um, a, a particular skill set. I've been fortunate in that I'm kind of a utility infielder. I, you know, it's kind of put me in coach. Uh, and I've been able to sort of jump from genre to genre and style to style. You're able but, to take a look at something uh, on paper or look at a show that exists and sort of emulate that style and tone. Yeah, you know, the thing is you, you can't go in to uh, a preschool show and try to be writing a family guy. You know, you just have to sort of, and, and that's an extreme example, but you just have to sort of understand the rules of the road. And if you're able to adapt to that, if that is something that you enjoy doing, then you're, you're a very powerful uh, part of the team. You're an important part of the team because you can be useful. And, I mean, the, we'll talk about this more, but, you know, the sort of the, the whole message that I want to impart to your listeners is the, the notion to the, your job as a writer is to be useful, to be the person that they want to go to, that can make their job easier, that can then can get the job done in a timely fashion, in a professional manner, and bring something, you know, yes, yes, match the style, but also bring something unique. So let's be clear as to who they are. Who are you being useful to? Well, you know, um, there, uh, uh, the thing that we do as, well, let's set things up. The work of the animation writer is different from the work of the, a live-action writer. Uh, in, when you and I worked at Disney TV Animation, we had these large staffs. That is very rarely the case now in animation. That is, uh, you, know, you might have a writer, producer, a story editor, and that's about it on staff. You might have one staff writer. You know, when we were in, you know, working on the Disney Afternoon umpty thousand years ago, you know, we had, what, 15 or 18 guys in the room, sure. guys and gals in the room. Sure. But that's simply no longer the case in animation. You know, Nick and Disney still have small staffs on shows, but everything else is just freelance. In live-action TV, it's all staff-written. There's no such thing as a freelance market if you are trying to write for a sitcom. You're either staffed or you're unemployed. So it's a very different animal now. It, it, so it as has a, changed over the years. As a freelancer, then, you're trying to please in animation who? The story editor, producers, directors? Story editor, uh, you know, yes. There's a story. Usually the, the, your point of contact is the story editor. That story editor can be the creator or that can be a person who has been brought in to run the show. Some shows are created by uh, an artist or based on a pre-existing property. Those things, you know, where you, you're, you're not, you're servicing the material rather than the vision. I mean, if, you create, if you're working for the guy who created SpongeBob SquarePants, that's different from the guy who's doing the newest iteration of Transformers because it's a legacy property and you, they, they may be doing a different take on it, but you're still doing, um, you know, something that is in the service of a much bigger machine. Sure. And, and when you're, you know, tonally, obviously there are big differences between writing for, um, as you say, action, hard action for kids and the, in the, the teenagers mostly, and yeah. then you've also written for the little ones. Uh, yeah. what, do you, what do you do when you're thinking about stories tonally that changes the way that you approach the stories? You know... This if anything, Lynn, you may not, maybe not. You know, you're you're trying to tell. Well, first of all, when you're writing animation, I don't care if you're writing about a guy in long underwear and a cape, or you're writing about a talking duck. You're still talking about the human condition, because you know, yes, you can do a, a toy-driven show that's just about things going boom, 
but you know the best kind of writing in any medium, the kind of writing that the the reason any of us become writers, that kind of writing is about saying something that that speaks to your experience, to a common experience, right? So I'm when I go in and I'm trying to tell a story that's whether it's a preschool show or if it's a comedy adventure, you know, you're trying to do something that, you know, engages the audience emotionally or just, you know, viscerally, you know, uh, I had a, I had a great experience. I've written three episodes of a show called Thunderbirds Are Go. It's a, a reboot of the old puppet series from the 60s. Yeah. But it's the most beautiful thing you will ever see. Catch that on Amazon. And that is a great adventure show. But there's always an emotional subtext to what they do. It's run by a fellow named Rob Hoagie. I don't know if you know Rob. No. Really smart writer. Sorry, I really don't know Really good him. producer. So, uh, and it's co-production between ITV and Amazon, and the special effects, the physical production is done by the TV division of Peter Jackson's company, New Zealand. Oh, nice. Oh, God, it's so good looking. Steve, honestly, you, you would love this thing. And that's, that's for the boys, 8 to 11, and everything on either side of it, too. Brilliant show. I worked on a show that was um, that's on BBC Kids and on Disney Channel, or Disney Junior here, called Octonaut charming show really funny and that is a preschool show but it is very a very light touch on um on content you know educational content it's just there's an environmental theme sort of overarching but they're not they don't have a uh point to be made about it so it's it's just every show is different and if you're smart or lucky or talented or whatever enough you're able to jump in and say yeah i can play in this pool um, and here's six ideas that I'm pitching to you, the story editor, and which one of these fits what you need. You know, you will run into, thanks, we love it, we have it, or, we, you know, or we're not going to do that kind of show, but if you show you're understanding the show well enough to get close, you know, you're halfway there. Well, you, you, I think you hit on a major important uh, point uh, a moment ago in terms of that doesn't matter what show you're writing, it still must be emotional in some way. It has to appeal to the emotional core of humans and not to their intellect or their academic thoughts, but to their passion, to emotion. Wouldn't you Listen, agree? I'm, I'm all for doing a show uh, that, that speaks to issues, by the way. Uh, you know, I, uh, you, you mentioned Static Shock. I, I was fortunate enough to work for Alan Burnett. On, uh, I did 16 of those. Alan, who has done an episode already of Story Beat. And I listened to it, and you, you guys had a great conversation. Yes, and, indeed. And by the way, I was at Alan's retirement party after umpteen years in the animation business. This is, for those who don't know, Alan Burnett is kind of the, the, uh, the guy who, uh, yeah, I guess the unsung hero of Warner, War, Brother. Warner Brothers Animation. Absolutely. He has had his hands on every Everything. Everything at Warner's from Batman the Animated Series forward, he is a the Zen master of animation. Alan comes into a room. People are throwing their hands in the air. They don't know what to do. Alan comes in. He's this picture of calm. Everybody says, oh, Alan's here. It's all going to be okay. And then he shows you where, I mean, he's got a masterful sense of story. He's a great writer. And he comes in and he says, here's what to do, and this is good, and fix that. And everything is good because of somebody like that. <laughs> when I grow up, I want to be Alan Burnett. <laughs> I mean, honest <laughs> to God, people like that are so rare in any business. I, I think we all want to be Alan Burnett. Yeah, Alan, yeah, no, Alan he, is that is that is maybe the greatest uh, story man ever. Yeah, I would say yes. I would say yes. I mean, I, 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 I'm privileged to consider him a, uh, to call him a friend. And uh, last night, it just so happens we're having this conversation today. This is immediately dating your recording but there was a retirement party for her uh at warner brothers and people from every walk of life in the animation business if he didn't start you on your career he helped make your writing better and there were people from production and acting and uh the great voice director andrea romano was there I mean, everybody who ever worked with Alan is there and telling him, thank you, Alan, we love you, Alan, 
Don't go away, Alan. <laughs> well, he's I, he's uh, he's going into a very much desired retirement. That we all know. So let's talk about um, some of the process. When you're thinking about stories or you're watching stories, what for you distinguishes a st- something that you know is at least in, for you, for your perspective, makes a story good or worthy? What what do you look for? Sorry, um well, uh, the engagement that we talked about. Uh, am I am I brought into this world? Uh, if it's if it's um, if it's emotionally satisfying, uh, and it, it it doesn't matter if it's you know I'm a big fan of romantic comedies. I'm a huge fan of musicals. I'd love to talk with you about that at some point. Sure. Um, uh, if I had my druthers, I would have been writing musicals. But you know, on the other hand, you know, paying for food and and lodging is a great idea. <laughs> uh, you know, but um, the the if you're just watching a, a television series. Does that episode, if, if you're, or you're reading one, if you know, you're trying to get in, does that script match the tone of the show? Does it, you know, do you see something that pulls you immediately out of the show and say, no, those characters would never do that? If you know the show well enough to say, mm, nah, then that's a problem. That's that that's a speed bump for me when I'm just watching, even as. As you know, just as a consumer, in terms of as entertainment, when it's a show I'm trying to write for, and I can see, you know, if somebody sends me, uh, you know, a story editor sends me three episodes, and he says, "What do you think?" and I say, "I really like this. I really like that." And I didn't get that one at all. It's worth a conversation because what if I'm wrong? What if no, 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 no? We're doing that kind of show too. Or he says, "Yeah, yeah, that's that's just uh, that that was a uh, that wasn't one of our best." You know, it, 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 remember, this is all a business of taster's choice. It's all subjective. So what I think is a great script, you may say, eh, do or you, vice versa. Do you think we, that... We, we, do all, you think we that, all of us are waiting, you know, to be entertained. Sure. Do you think that um, characters make a show? Do you think that there's a difference in the way that you approach character development in one type of show yeah. over another? Absolutely. Absolutely, because... You know, when uh, you can be with horrible characters and utterly riveted by them. I mean, think of people like like uh, characters like uh, Don Draper or Tony Soprano. Uh, where my wife and I just finished watching um, uh, The Handmaid's Tale uh, from Hulu. These are you know some some horrible people doing horrible things, and yet you're engaged by the tale because it's it rings of of human truth i'm i'm actually i i can't you know back when we was on the air i couldn't wait for the next episode of the sopranos to see what horrible stupid self-destructive thing tony would do because you cared about this guy even though he was a miserable monster it's just it's fascinating I mean, all good tragedy, you know, I guess Shakespeare made a pretty good career writing about people who do terrible things. Absolutely. Well, you know, a big part of it, a big part about what we teach, because as you know, I've been teaching for a while. Um, yeah. One of the big things that we teach that I think is a, is absolutely the hallmark of great shows is that they are, you have characters, both um, likable and unlikable, uh, in constant conflict with one another, and that conflict is what keeps us uh, riveted to the storytelling because we want to see how this conflict is going to work out. Yeah. You know, the, one of the hardest things to do is to write the good guy. The most fun is writing the villains, you know, because well, the villains can be doing outrageous right, things. Right. They, they don't have to conform to societal rules, and that's interesting. Getting a, uh, you know, writing Captain America, the, the guys who did the first Captain America movie, it was brilliant because he was, yeah, he was a Boy Scout, but he was a, a, a really relatable Boy Scout, and we cared so much for him, whereas perhaps the other Boy Scout, uh, the newest iteration of Superman, is less identifiable because, first of all, it goes against what we all remember about Superman, and I'm sounding like an old guy here, but... You know, he's there's a lot less to love about this iteration than there was previous iterations. 
Well, yeah. absolutely. You know, I, I've said this on the show before, but it's a great quote and it's worth repeating. Um, Leo Tolstoy, who was not a bad writer himself, uh, yeah, I think not he so. Could work. Not, yes, it's a, <laughs> a little bit. He used to say that the best stories come from good versus good. <laughs> okay. Yes. The 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 thing that happens a lot, uh, unfortunately, there's bad writing in every medium, right? Absolutely. But the, in in cartoon writing, the, the lazy cartoon writer is the one who makes the villain evil for vil- for evil's sake. Absolutely. The muhu ha ha guy. The the villain should always consider that he is the hero of the story. He or she is doing this because it is the right thing to do. Not uh, not the robbing the ba- robbing a bank kind of villain, but uh, somebody who's who's a significant villain. Uh, we need we need to get that. We need to understand why this person is doing what he's doing. Well, the, and, and then if you're following Tolstoy, if you have two characters that we like and they're butting heads, wow, that really tugs it at the viewer's heartstrings. And I think yes. they, I think I'm going to guess that in a bunch of the, the stuff that you've written for the littler kids, that you have that somewhat, that there aren't arch villains, that there are characters that are just sort of in the way of your protagonist of the story getting what they're trying to get, whatever their goal is. There seems, yeah, it's usually in the really young shows, there cannot be villains. There are there can be people who have a different perspective, perhaps, or interested in doing something uh, different from the protagonist, but it's really more of a misunderstanding. There's no antagonist in the classic sense as we think of in, you know, writing for adult dramas or, you know, even in comedies. You know, you have a comic villain. Uh, but we, there's there's less of the butting heads and op- opposing agendas in the youngest shows. There may be some, but I, my my experience in it, which is as I say, a smaller part of what I've sure, done. Sure. Um, it, there's less inclination to do, uh, uh, you know, muscle uh, uh, mustache uh, twirlers. You well, know? well, certainly in the in the uh, the. the the what we used to call boy action shows, the stuff that's for teens, uh, yeah. there's a whole lot more headbutting there. Oh yes, yes. That's, and, that's all and, about that's all about characters, you know, trying to um, one up or do in one another. Oh yes, absolutely. The, but you know, again, if you're writing for eight to eleven year olds or eleven to fourteen year olds, but usually eight to eleven is sort of the sweet spot. That's very different from the three to five year old cohort you know you just it's a different kind of storytelling and as i say i think it's it's challenging and for those who do it extremely well uh very very rewarding do you, do you ever uh, do you I, ever find yourself having to avoid i i mean this is something that i'm, I'm i already think i know the answer to but i want to hear what your take on it is that you do not talk down to your audiences no matter what their age uh dirty little secret i don't write for any i write for myself I write to entertain myself, mm-hmm. and I cannot stand shows that seem to be writing down. This is, you know, I, I bristle when I hear people say, uh, you know, oh, the kids won't get it. Boy, I don't know. As soon as as soon as a kid becomes verbal, I think they get it. They understand the way they interact with their brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers and what friends. They understand the way people interact with one another and behave, and they will get it a lot more than a lot of people give them credit for. And that's, that's to me, that's one of the, the, the challenges of saying, nah, you know, we can, we can try this. You know? And if nothing else, if you're writing for a really young show, the parents will enjoy it, and they won't feel that it's punishment to sit and watch a half hour of Fluffy the Funny Furball if, you know, they're... They're, they're being entertained, too. Well, the you, know, par- you can write the par- on different levels in the same show. The parents may always... have an entirely different take on what Fluffy the Furball is. Yes. You know, I mean, people of all ages, I, used, I mentioned SpongeBob earlier. People of all ages love that show. It's a giant hit. It's, it's one of the foundations of the success of Nickelodeon, right? Absolutely. There's a lot to be, you can, you can just enjoy it for the big silly, 
Or you can say, wow, they're talking about some pretty sophisticated stuff well, here. Well, it's like Rocky and Bullwinkle used to be on so many well, levels. Okay, Rocky and Bullwinkle and Get Smart were the shows that taught me what was funny. You know, that, that's, that's yeah, 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 and today, if you were to watch those shows, particularly Get Smart, the pace is slower than we're used to and all that sort of thing. Some of it's what we would probably consider corny. But I loved those shows and Rocky and Bullwinkle. And the, by the way, the Warner Brothers shorts, the Bugs Bunny shorts, that was for theatrical release for adults to watch. You know, so it, cartoons sort of got a bad rap at some point or another. They're really for everybody and can be for everybody in the same episode or segment or short subject or whatever. Anyway, so, so who, who were your who were your earliest creative um, loves? What 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 brought you to being a writer and especially a writer of uh, animation? Well, I, <laughs> um, I when I was at uh, okay. Silly story here. I did have my first sale when I was a junior at UCLA. That's, that's and amazing. And I was one of those guys who was going to become a sitcom writer. I, that, to my mind, today, even still, that is a high art form. There's nothing more exciting to me than watch, you know, uh, to sit in an audience or, God willing, on, on the stage with the other writers, watching a show, you know, cameras move, four cameras moving around and watching a play happen before your very eyes. It's, it's a thrilling uh, form of, of television. It's, ma it's magic when you're there. Oh, God, I love it. But, um, so I, originally I started out wanting to be a sitcom writer. I accidentally became a animation writer 10 years later. I mean, well, okay, here's another way of looking at it. I had my first professional sale when I was a junior at UCLA, but I wasn't a professional writer for another five or six years because I had to learn all the tricks of the trade, how to be a, a dependable writer, how what, to learn to rewrite. What are those first tricks? First draft, final draft, all that sort of stuff. What are, give us a few of those tricks. It's learning When you say learning how to rewrite, give us a couple of tips on that. Well, you have to learn to take notes, and not dictation, by the way. There's a distinct difference. My first assignment, I was terrified. The, I was on a show called, I kid you not, Holmes and Yo-Yo. I remember Holmes and Yo-Yo. It was, uh, and it was done by the guys, uh, two cops, one of whom was a robot. Um, it was run by the guys who had done Get Smart. So I was working with my childhood idols, and I, I had written a story. Back in that time, the latter Bronze Age, you could... Uh, a guy like me who had an interest in writing, I, you could call up a show, hey, I read in Variety that you guys got picked up. Can I read your pilot? And they sent it to me. This is no longer the case, by the way. Too many lawyers. Um, so I got a copy of it, and I wrote a story, and I sat on it. And Because um, <clears throat> why are they going to read from me? I'm just a college kid. So my mom said, tell you what, I'll send it in. And she did. And a few weeks later, I heard from the story editor on a Friday afternoon, and he said, we are going to make your weekend. And so they took my story, and they slammed it together with a story from another writer, a fellow named John Landis. I'm not sure whatever happened to him. Yeah. And for some reason, I got the gig to write it as a script. Nice. And I went in, and I, I wrote a first draft, and I did a terrible job, <laughs> I, you know, because... I was terrified. I was, you know, trying to look confident, and I was also completely out of my depth. Sure. Um, and uh, you have to learn to take the note and s understand what's going on underneath the note, Inter interpret the note. Are you, do you have to fix a joke? Are you fixing a word? Are you starting from scratch? You have to, you know, be able to calmly support your perspective and suggest another alternative find areas of compromise or not and if that doesn't work then you know you, you know you ask you do what is asked of you to the best of your ability you know um the important thing and and this is something you learn over time outside of you know like i said first draft is not final draft learn to rewrite your stuff 
as many times as necessary to make it readable. Mm -hmm. Um, But a really important thing for anybody who aspires to be a professional writer is to have the proper attitude and be a good soldier. One of my friends, Stan Berkowitz, I don't know if you know Stan. Certainly. He's a great writer and story editor. Great. And he says he hires writers to, who make his job easier. And if you can do that by turning in good work in a timely fashion, they will hire you again. Um, Alan Burnett at that retirement party last night, he said he hires people who can teach him something, which I think is very interesting. He also said he hires people who are smarter than him, but... Again, that's just Alan being modest because he's one of the smartest as well as kindest people I know. Sure, right? absolutely. Um, but it's uh, you have to be a team player. You have to say, you know, how can I help this project? And if it's if it's you know coming up with a brilliant idea in the room, that's great. And if you're not great in the room, when you go home and you do the work, you just you sweat the details. And you know, do everything from from carting it to to uh, st- tearing stuff apart and starting all over if you need to. Do your best. Don't be lazy. Do a spell check for Christ's sake. You know, at, at minimum. <laughs> at minimum, you know, if you're writing in Final Draft, a screenwriting software, it's it can it can read the script to you. If you don't have somebody who can read the script to you, so you can hear the words out loud. Have the machine do it, because you will find mistakes you've made that you cannot, your eyeballs cannot see, but your ears will say, oh, wait a minute, I missed a preposition, or that sentence makes no sense. You know, it's very handy. Um, you know, if you want to be the only person making every creative decision, let me suggest that you become a sculptor, <laughs> because that's the only way you're going to have that opportunity. Even novelists have people saying, you know... You could fix that, and you have to be able to say, "Yeah, good idea." You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, that is that is for sure. So you, you know, let's go down this road a little bit. You have also uh, in your career not just been a freelance writer, but also a story editor, where people were bringing work to you, mm-hmm. and and that you would then have to work on it, correct it, um, change things, et cetera, et cetera. What is it that you want writers that are bringing work to you? To make your life easier, aside from just spell checking and so on, what in the work itself um, would you like to see uh, more frequently out of writers? Well, again, understand the demands of the material. If if the marching orders are, we need this script to be. I, I know this is going to sound crazy to, to somebody, but you know you're you're writing to a format. So if you've got a uh, the, the the production says we need scripts to have 200 or less dialogue slugs, and the script now it used to be um, when you and I were at Disney we were writing you know in the high 30s and 40s pages right correct now I'm I'm on shows where they say for a half hour of television which is actually 21 or 22 minutes we only want a script that is 25 or 28 pages long sure okay so. You have to say, okay, how can I tell this story succinctly? How can I hit all the points we've talked about in the room? How do I get that done? Don't hand your, don't hand a 40-page script to a sh- show that has to have a 28-page script. It, you're not helping. You're making the job harder. Do you find that that happens to you frequently? Where, where I would assume it's mostly newer writers that are coming to you and handing you page counts that are just wildly off. Well, that I, and again, this this all sounds sort of secretarial, but it's it's essential because when you say I don't know how to fix it, you do it to the story editor. You're coming in. This is your first time at bat with this writer, with the story editor, or on a show. And you say, I, I just I couldn't find anything to cut. That means oh boy. every word of yours is precious, and that means you're not going to work again. There is no such thing as it can't be cut, you know? Right. I mean, what's the old uh, Larry Gelbart, learn to kill your darlings? Yes. You know, you really have to be brutal with La- your Larry, own work. Larry Gelbart so, stole that from William Faulkner. Okay. Well, you see, then it, it's good to have appropriate sources and actually people who have read the material, but... <laughs> You know, all I know is television. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. um, 
you know, I, I, I can sing you a theme song from a, a 60s show, but, you know, ask me to quote Faulkner, and I'm going to say, uh, what's he worked on lately? Are you, you know? telling me you don't know the theme song to As I Lay Dying? Uh, actually, uh, no, I haven't heard that one, but I'm hoping you'll sing it later. <laughs> oh, you, trust me, you don't want that to happen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's the thing. I, you know, to, to digress to musicals for a second, sure. I love the fact that, I mean, you got one made. That is such, I, if I had something like that on my resume, I would just, I would be so thrilled. I've written songs, occasionally you get the chance to write songs for the cartoons. Sure. Not often. Like what show, a, what show have you written songs for? Well, the first, one of the early, the first song I got made professionally was a little ditty, like a 10 second ditty, 15 second ditty for a Gummy Bears episode. <laughs> and it was sung by Rob Paulson, who's now the of voice. Of course. Uh, you know him as the voice of Pinky and a couple of the turtles and all that kind of stuff. He's the turtles. Uh, and he sang this introductory song for a, uh, an 11 minute episode for uh, the, uh, Gummy Bears called The White Knight. And it was, so much fun. And then a few years later on Ozzy and Drix, I got a chance to write the lyrics with uh, the guy who was writing the music on the show, uh, Randall Chrisman. And um, I got to write a song that, that Where There's Smoke episode you mentioned. Yes. The villain in it was nicotine. I don't know if you remember the show, but it was a, a cold pill and a, a bacteriophage fighting crime inside the body of a, a preteen, right, right? right, or teenager. And the villain was Tim Curry. So I got to write a, wow. a nasty song for Tim Curry. Wow. So that was, you know, check off that box. That was great. But, you know, then there are people like, like Randy Rogel, who wrote most of the, most all the really wonderful songs that everybody knows by heart from Animaniacs. Right. And, you know, Randy, uh, by the by, digression, for any of you who are listening, Randy Rogel, this ge genius writer and songwriter, and Rob Paulson, the voice of Pinky, of uh, Pinky and the Brain, and thousands, are touring and the thousands, country thousands now. of other characters as well. Right? Yes, and a, thousands of other, and and both brilliantly nice, funny guys. They are now touring the company with an evening, uh, an, an Animaniacs live show, and sometimes if it's a big enough venue. They tie in with an orchestra, the local community orchestra, and they have a full orchestra backing them up. Or otherwise, it's just Randy on the piano, which he plays brilliantly, and and Rob singing these funny, wonderful songs. I mean, I, again, uh, if I can't be Alan Burnett, I'd like to be Randy Rogel. These are guys who are just so talented. Uh, so look for that at your local theaters, uh, you know, stage venues, that sort of thing. It is a great evening. I, Wonderful. Th evening. No doubt. They were they were actually here. You know, I'm, we're broadcasting from or podcasting from uh, Pittsburgh, and they. I did not get a chance to go out and see them because I had other things going on. But they were here uh, on sort of in the in the suburbs of Pittsburgh at a place oh. called the Carnegie uh, um, Carnegie Music Hall or whatever it's called out in uh, uh -huh. Homestead. But the the um, th that it is a trick to incorporate music with lyrics into an animated show, especially if it doesn't, you know, normally belong there. If it's part of the show right. and, and you exactly. get it every week, that's a different thing. Yeah, um, and, and when you're, when you are... Uh, like Phineas and that, Ferb. Phineas and Ferb has a song every week. Absolutely, it, and it's so much fun. Uh, um, I think uh, Holly Huckins uh, did a series uh, called Sheriff Kelly uh, that was on Disney Junior. And they had a song in pretty much every episode, I think. And it, it, these are wonderful shows because it's incredibly entertaining when the characters break in a song. The, now we're seeing a resurgence of music, live action musicals, which makes my heart glad. This is, I mean, just to show you how, how one track I am on this, Steve, my first script, the first script I ever wrote, it's in a box somewhere, was a Star Trek spoof in sixth grade. It wasn't a spoof, it was <laughs> Deadly Earnest. It was another episode of Star Trek that I, my friends and I performed in sixth grade. But the first stuff I did in high school outside of student films was I, I did little musical uh, reviews. And the first film, the only film I made at UCLA, my project one there, was a one-song, nine-minute, Super 8 
sound sync musical. <laughs> and believe me, in 1975, the technology to make that happen was not easy. No, that would have been a lot of, that would have been serious technical challenge. Oh, I, I won't bore you and your listeners with the details. But, I mean, I love that genre. And, um, you know, I have a couple of friends who are, you know, work as Broadway producers, a couple very successfully. And it just sounds like, you know, a dream come true. Well, I, I, let, yeah. But let, again, whatever. Let me, let me suggest to you, so I'm also suggesting to the listeners, that yeah. you've been doing this business of writing for a long, long, long time. Yes, and there's, I have. I'm and really the, old. You are. You're, you're 180 years old, but you're very good looking. Yeah, for, but I, I, you know, I don't go outdoors but, much, so I look much younger. But... <laughs> Very smart. Um, or wear sunscreen, one of the two. Uh, yeah, but here's the thing. And I would say to you, I can hear the, the passion that you have for this. Um, I don't know that it's an actual genre, but it's a, a form or format yeah. called yeah. musicals. There's nothing stopping you at any age, even after you've done it all this time and have and have no, uh, let's say you have no cachet in that particular world. Um, right. There's nothing that should stop you from sitting down and writing whatever floats your boat, whatever is your passion. Absolutely. So, and, so and find right. yourself and a... Listen, I, I, am, I am extraordinarily fortunate to have been able to make a living this long as a writer. Absolutely. I know that. There, I knew a lot of people who were you know, sitcom writers back in the 80s, and they have aged out. Yep. You know, the phone kind of stops ringing. Unless yeah. you're at one of the titans of the business, after 40, you can't be funny anymore for some reason, which is nuts. In animation, there is less of that ageism. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm very lucky. I've been able to, I mean, yes, there's a lot of hard work involved and, you know, like I say, sort of dedication to being a team player and all that sort of thing. But I, uh, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm still working as a writer. You know, it's not where I started out. It's not what I thought I was going to be. Uh, you know, the, the, the boy wonder dream goes away after, you know, you, you have your first couple of sales. I, I, I sold that thing in the junior year. I then had an option on a television series I created about the first black president in the United States. This was 1977. Like, that's going to happen, right? You know, and then there was radio silence for three years. I couldn't get arrested. So you have to be... How did you weather that? Um... Well, I, I had a, a lot of temp jobs. I um, wrote, you know, <clears throat> samples. But you never I, gave up your dream, did you? you just... No, absolutely not. Because let's face it, I had a parting of the ways with the sciences in the 11th grade, so I have no <laughs> other skills. So, you know, it was like, yeah, I, I was, I always, as, you know, sixth grade proves, I always wanted to be a writer, probably before I knew that I wanted to be a writer. It just seemed to be what I fell into. And when I started writing those shows in high school and people were laughing and applauding and saying that was wonderful and they actually named an award after me at my high school for those shows, I said, oh, yeah, this is, this is my career. It was just weird, you know, but, you know, sometimes it just gets dropped in your lap and you say, okay, that's what I'm going to do now. And it works out. In one way or another, sometimes. In my case, I got lucky. All right, so let's talk about a couple of practical things. Um, your day, for instance, you as a freelance writer, you don't work in in a an office that's outside of your own home, at least not frequently. Most of the time you work out of your home, I assume. That's correct. And so, okay, a couple things. So give us an idea about what your day is like as a writer. And I, I don't need to hear about your breakfast, but, you know, <laughs> what, what, what do you, how do you, how does your day evolve? I'm sure they're all different, but what is the general gist of it? And tell me about as well your office and how, what you need around you in order to work. Do you have any touchstones or talismans or anything in your office that helps you to be a writer? Well, okay, let's see. First of all, uh, for the people who are the, the youngest people who are listening to this, um, recognize that you are pursuing a career where you have homework seven days a week. If you say, oh, God, this is going to be easy, I'll write when I feel like it, mm, no. You are actually, when, especially for the freelancer, you are, you know, when the work comes in, you have to jump on it, and get it done. By the way, here's your job, and you're behind, is the way it always works, right? 
Sure. So you you have to recognize that you know, time management skills are key. Um, uh, recognition that this is uh, a sedentary lifestyle, but it is also a stressful lifestyle. So you have to find a way to you know keep your body working. <laughs> you know because I um, as I mentioned before we started recording, I work at a standing desk now. Um, some people think that's nonsense. It has helped me tremendously. I can write for more hours at a time and get through the work faster with the keyboard and the screen up in front of my eyes instead of sitting sort of curling up into a little ball in front of my desk. Mm -hmm. I work both ways. It depends. I switch up depending on how I feel and, you know, what the nature of the task is. But I, I definitely... You know, you have, I mean, some people write an entire script on a yellow pad, and then they type it in. I, you know, I type fairly quickly, so that isn't the way I go. I, I you know, I'm, I'm typing and thinking, trying to keep the, the, the material coming as quickly as possible. And then, of course, you go in and do all the rewriting and stuff. It is a, for me, it, as you know, in animation, uh, another thing we should talk about is, the difference between pursuing a career in animation and a career in live action in terms of remuneration. But um, animation is a volume business. To make a proper living, particularly in a, an expensive city like Los Angeles or New York or whatever, you have to do a lot of work. You Ex have to do explain, multiple episodes. Explain why it's a volume business. Because, and we can, I mean, this could take another hour to discuss unions, but... The animation, most animation writing that you see on television is not written under the uh, uh, Writers Guild of America contract. The stuff you see in primetime, the Fox shows, the, the Simpsons and the Family Guys, those are written under a Writers Guild contract. Long, complicated history, but the work that most of us do who write what used to be called children's programming or Saturday morning television or whatever you want to call it, that is written under either under the supervision of the local 839 and IATSE affiliate, uh, which calls itself the Animation Guild. They used to be called Motion Picture Screen Cartoonists, uh, which is part of the problem because it's both artists and writers in the same union and they have different needs. But I digress. Or you're writing completely non-union. Second point. The a, a half hour of television in animation is paid 20 or 30 per, 20 or 30 cents on the dollar compared to a primetime situation comedy and you do not get any residuals for that now the, the 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 IA gives you an explanation that no no you're getting it in another form in terms of a contribution to a pool of money etc cetera, etc cetera. but in terms of a green envelope in the mail there are no residuals unfortunately writers guild members are now discovering with streaming systems and sort of the diminishing of the syndication market, the giant amounts of money that they used to make for reruns has fallen precipitously. That's why the Writers Guild nearly went on strike a few weeks ago. Um, but anyway, so the reason, I, sorry about the long digression, the quite all right. reason that you're writing cartoons as many as you possibly can is because that's how you, you know, feed your family and, you know, pay the mortgage, put your kid through college. And there's and no residuals. Uh, because there are no residuals. There is something called foreign levies, which the Writers Guild and other guilds and unions distribute a couple of times a year to members for stuff that has been shown in Europe and South America. But that we're really in the weeds here. <laughs> well, that's for sure we're in the weeds, but that's part of what we do here. So let me yeah. ask you a, a kind of a fun question. You've clearly worked with lots of different people in the business, and you've yeah. uh, worked for all the different studios and so on. Do you, somewhere in your experience, did you have some bizarre experience or story that would be fun to hear about? Oh, golly. Um, well, you know, as I was talking about sitcom, you know, the, the notion of seeing a play on its feet every Friday or Wednesday or whenever they tape, that's great fun. I haven't had as much experience with that as I would have liked. But the closest I get to that experience 
um, is when, if, if you're on staff, this is more likely to happen, but you know, when you're a freelancer, it's a real gift. If you get a chance to be invited to the recording of your script, and you are in the booth, and there's an engineer and the voice director and the story editor or producer or whomever on one side, and then there's the, the voice talent on the other side. And you get to watch these brilliantly talented, hilarious people record what you've written. And you hear the words come to life and, and oftentimes made even better by their interpretation and by some ad libs sometimes too. And that is a giant thrill. So early on at Disney, I got to see people like uh, Paul Winchell and, and June Foray. And, Jim and, Cummings, and Lorenzo Music, and you know, these names may not mean much to people sort of in the general population, but they were huge. I never saw Mel Blanc live, but you know, Frank Welker, you know, who's been doing this for umpty billion years, you know, sure. you, you see these people, and then you know, they're the, the cool guest stars, which they would sometimes bring into, and he's like, oh yeah, I've seen your movies. Uh, that's all fun. You know, that's the fanboy part of it. Um, I, that's a real kick. Uh, have I even answered your question? <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah more, more or less. But, you know, now we have uh, voices like Maurice LaMarche, and, and, and you've already mentioned Rob Paulson and folks okay, like that. Now, I have to say, if you are fortunate enough to write on a show where Maurice LaMarche or Rob or any of these other guys, they're, they're performing, it's like... It's 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 the the golden ticket. It is so fantastic. These people make me laugh as soon as they get into the room. I actually uh, you, uh, one of the shows I work. I did one episode of um, Rescue Bots, uh, Transformers Rescue Bots. It's a younger iteration, and I think a, a really great version of the Transformers uh, franchise. Um, uh, Nicole Dubuque uh, runs that show, mm -hmm. and. I wrote one that was kind of a Halloweenish episode, and in it, Maurice LaMarche used his Orson Welles voice oh. as part of the the sort of the the War of the Worlds analog that they did to fool the bad guys. So he was doing the brain. He was doing, which is the voice he does for the brain, but he did it here, and we were able to actually I, I cribbed some dialogue from. The War of the Worlds script, just paraphrasing here and there, you know, but putting it in the context of this, their, you know, where the town where they all live, and it was, oh my God, I was just dying with laughter to hear to hear him do that, you know, oh ladies and gentlemen, you know, it's just unbelievable, oh the humanity <laughs> kind of stuff. It was just so much fun. So again, this is this is all, this is icing on the cake, you know. If you get a chance to earn a living as a writer, it's a it's a wonderful, wonderful way to live, um, and 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 uh, but all this other stuff is like, oh yeah, they give me that too. Oh, you know, please, how well, can you say no to this kind of world? I right? completely agree with you. Uh, you know, the 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 times, not 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 all the time, but the times that I've been invited in. Uh, to see a recording of something I've written has always been, I mean, it just is like, it's like, a, it's magic time. It's just a whole different it, thing. Yeah, I mean, you and I both worked on Bonkers, and the, the voice of Bonkers was Jim Cummings. Now, Gee, yeah. for those who may say that name is familiar, he's also the voice of Winnie, the, the, the television version of Winnie the Pooh. And Tigger. And he's also now Tigger. Yeah. He was Don Carnage on Tailspin. Um, I, did, I did one Winnie the Pooh when I was at Disney, and it was a Western. And he did a Jack Nicholson imitation, well, ish, you know, a, 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 bad, a bad horse. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it was just like, uh, it was gold. It's just brilliant. You know, you hear these people who are so talented, and they, they just make it uh, wonderful. And then, of course, it helps that, you know, like in the case of Winnie the Pooh, if they do a great job of producing it. Uh, that, that Thunderbirds Are Go series that I worked on, uh, some of the best voice actors going, and some of them are movie stars, uh, do the voices on that series. Um, Rosamund Pike is the voice of Lady Penelope wow. on that. She won an Oscar, okay? You know, you just, people do animation on the, on the art, uh, the, uh, the performing side, 
to because it's so much fun for them. And they don't have to put on costumes or makeup. They just come in and do no. what they do. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 not a bad gig. It's a very yeah. nice gig. Well, yeah. Len, Len, we are coming toward the end of the show. We, we've had a wonderful chat here. Again, I've been speaking with the uh, exceptionally uh, talented writer and story editor, Len Yuli. And um, what I'm wondering, Len, is do you have perhaps one piece of good advice that you can lend to the viewers, something that uh, you think that is important for them to have in their careers or as a writer? Well, on the, the, the career side of it, hmm, okay, two things. Um, be kind to yourself. Don't be envious of others. The only person you're competing with is yourself. If you get the job, it's because of, because of dumb luck and timing and who you know and talent. And if you don't get the job, it really wasn't yours in the first place. Um, my wife works as a script supervisor in TV commercials. She's one of the very best in that business. One of her coworkers once told a production assistant, the easiest way to look like a professional is to show up 15 minutes early. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, in other words, be prepared. Do your homework. Practice your craft. Have a good attitude. Uh, and contribute something. Be a collaborator, you know? Uh, practically speaking, write as many scripts as you can. Learn how to do the job. Then, um, I'm sorry to say, you have to move to a city where they make the shows and be ready to do some other job if you're able to become an assistant to a writer, a producer, a story editor, you'll be on the inside, you'll get to know the show, and when an opportunity arises, and frankly, that's how people get hired these days, you'll be ready. All of the young writers, almost all of the young writers I know, who are getting their first breaks, who are moving up the ladder and building careers, that's how they are doing it. I mean, I, I, know, I can name three or four young writers who are now getting multiple assignments because they are inside the room, learning the show, and then knocking it out of the park. You know, oftentimes getting more at bat than us, you know, you know, wizened old professionals, because they are really young and excited, and they have learned what they need to do to get the work done. Half the battle is just knowing the right people. Um, yeah, absolutely. And the way you know the right people is you go in and you... you you fetch coffee, or you mm -hmm. run the photocopier, or you organize the, the production charts. These, the, the hours are terrible, the pay is worse, but it is, you're investing in yourself. Well, that's, that's a the, pretty good way to go about it these days. That's, you know? the, that's very wise advice, and that's the training round. That's where you, ha it's where you learn the business. Yeah, and, and, that's the, and that's it. It is the business of the show. Uh, sorry, cliche, but there it is. Yeah. Well, Len, I want to thank you so much for coming on Story Beat today. I think that this we've had a terrific uh, chat, and, and you've imparted so much wisdom and, and very smart stuff. And I, I hope that uh, our listeners have gotten a, you know, a, a, a great deal out of what you've had to say, because I think you've given us uh, lots to chew on. And I, Well, I, I hope they can sort of uh, cut to the chase more than I have. Sorry about the rambling, but I do get sort of excited about talking about this. Oh, uh, you know, that, I thank you for the opportunity. I think the rambling is all a good part of it, and, and I thank you again. Thanks so much. Today's Story Beat tip is all about instincts. Excellent instincts can be honed from modest ones, though it can take dedication, effort, and a lot of energy. You can learn a great deal about the value of various stories simply by immersing yourself in a great many stories. That means reading books, plays, and screenplays, as well as watching TV shows and movies and regularly attending the live theater. The more that you read and see, the more likely it is that when you come across a great new story idea, you'll recognize its broader appeal and potential. Just as importantly, you'll more readily recognize those stories that are not worth your time. Most of us are already master story watchers. We become expert audience members early in life. We're exposed, some may say overexposed, to many thousands of hours of movie and TV stories by the time we graduate from high school. Most of us know what makes a story good and what doesn't, even if we're unable to articulate the how or why of it. But few people actually know why a story is good, what makes it tick, why it affects them, or why it works so well, or, or perhaps doesn't. 
Even professional writers often can't explain what it is that they do to tell a story. Many writers have instinctive talent and skill, but that doesn't mean that they have the ability to explain the process. Fortunately, we don't need an academic understanding of how a story works to be able to write. No formal training is required, but we must have a healthy, well-developed set of storytelling instincts. In most cases, such instincts develop largely as a result of copious amounts of observation, i.e. watching movies and TV. And those well-developed instincts will, in turn, be revealed through the stories you choose to write and your particular voice. So spend some serious time reading everything you can while also watching plays, movies, TV, and so on. Think of it as the most pleasurable work assignment you've ever been given. And so we've come to the end of today's story beat. This podcast would not have been possible without the tremendous support of the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.